Joining me this morning, William Barclay, undergraduate student of philosophy and politics, and joining him, Ben Cope, a political writer and commentator. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Now, you have just been travelling, haven't you? You've just got back. from. Yeah. A, is it a gap year? It's not a gap year, no. Oh. Uh, so I've just finished my first year at university, so I went with two friends to Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Wow, why did you choose them? Um, well, they're very different countries to the UK uh, <laughs> yes. lots, in lots of different ways. They're also just very mountainous. They're beautiful countries, right. uh, incredible culture. They're very Muslim countries. There's amazing mosques and madrasas. Mm. Um, yeah, they were all fascinating. Fantastic. Well, welcome along, and uh, I'm glad you're back safely well, from your you travels. And I'm sure your family are very pleased that you're home as well. And Ben, you've you've had a very busy time as well. Yes, working, just, just working. Yeah, Nothing not travelling. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh. Anyway, we're delighted that uh, to have you both here. Let's start, shall we, with this front page on the Daily Telegraph, or the Sunday Telegraph. Things will only get better before they get worse. Keir Starmer. I mean, welcome back to the UK. I mean, honestly, everything's falling apart. I mean. Clearly, this is something really odd is going on here, but he's placed this on a Sunday, right? This is not till Tuesday. What's going on behind this? Well, I think, I think he's laying the groundwork for what are going to be tax rises later on. I think they've been doing this for some time. It's obvious that they're, they've released this on Sunday. The speech is coming out on Tuesday. I think, actually, he's been, in a way, quite clever. He's let the stories unfold... And so we had, you know, we had the rise, the the pensioner, um, the, the issue with the pensioners, the riots. He hasn't he hasn't come and made a big speech, and now he's he's let the time pass. And it looks actually, I think, more sort of statesmanly that he's he's coming and making this big speech as a response to all these issues. I think he's given himself time to respond in a sort of more adequate way, as opposed to getting dragged into the sort of twenty four hour news cycle of all these issues. I think he's been quite clever in the way he's. Let, t let given himself some time actually to respond. Is he clever or is he a chicken? Well, it depends which side of it you are. I, I, I think I think it's probably expected because I think you know d during the election campaign there was a lot of talk about there being some form of you know fiscal black hole that, that none of the no, parties... No, there wasn't. There was no talk up to the election. And suddenly when they got elected, suddenly, oh, we didn't know about not 22. From, not from Labour, but from, from commentators. I remember Paul Johnson... Right, yeah, sure, IFS sure. Very vocal Sorry, I mean, it. I thought you meant from Labour. But the fact is, I don't believe a word of it. They knew. They absolutely knew. And the fact is that I feel it was really disingenuous. I don't think... And someone just messaged to say only 20% of people voted for Labour, and I hope they realise what they've done. But just in terms of that, do you think people realised what they were getting? I don't. But I, th I think part of the trouble here is that I don't think any of the major political parties were honest about the, the fiscal situation facing the country. So I don't see, so, you know, the Conservatives obviously created the black hole. I think all the other minor parties had significantly larger sort of deficits or in inbuilt deficits in their, their manifestos. So I don't think any... The trouble is that now we don't have any sort of credible uh, commentators to really oppose this. And uh, just, uh, just coming back to you, William, if I can, it... It just seems really bad politics and also really inhumane when you stop the winter fuel payment to elderly people in this country who are already struggling on fixed incomes and yet you give these incredible pay rises to people in the public sector. So we know that uh, teachers and nurses get 5.5%, prison service workers, senior NHS managers, most of them I like to get rid of anyway, they went up by 5%, train drivers 14% over three years, unacceptable. Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of people who agree with you on that. And I think Labour have made a political decision in part. I think they're favouring younger voters, working voters over pensioners. Mm. Keir Starmer has made the point that actually the one thing he does need is economic growth. And the point he's making is how can he be expected to create economic growth without the trains but running... But the economy's on. already improving. It already is, but I think he wants more growth. We've just talked about the deficit. But surely, 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 if you're going to talk to the train drivers, and I understand that, fine, you might need to give them a pay rise, wouldn't you change the working practices? As Isabel was saying, you've got a four-day working week that if someone phones you on your lunch break, you're allowed to reset your clock. I mean, these are archaic practices. Yeah, and I think there's there's definitely a point there. But I think the trick, as with many issues, I think the train driver issue, this is an issue of modernisation. That's sort of cut, It's now coming about time. How do we look at train travel? In the years to come, the, the role of a train driver is going to change significantly, and I think the unions are looking to fight that. Of course. I think it's a huge issue for Labour and any government that comes in in the next ten years. I think there's certainly a point to make that maybe they were right to get this issue behind them and to look for economic growth in the short term. But obviously I, t I take your point that 
um, the Conservatives were looking for a change in working practices, I think lots of people would have been sy uh, sympathetic to that. Yeah. And, and do you know how much we pay? We, the taxpayer, pays to subsidise the railways just out of interest. You're going to tell me. £12 billion a year. £12 billion quid a year, and the trains don't run on time, they're always on strike. Isn't there an argument to say that actually, and I agree with you, that we do need trains to run, but actually they need to be cheaper. They need to be much cheaper, because for an hour journey, going back to where I live, is about 55 quid for an hour. I agree. I think um, I think a big trouble. So you know, Will, Will you were saying you, they, the, the Labour was trying to, to put these pay negotiations behind them. I don't think they have because they've essentially told the unions that if you come knocking, we'll <laughs> yeah, you can have whatever you want. Yeah. And you know, we've already yeah. seen that with the, the Aslev strikes kept coming one day later. So I think you know they've created problems down the line for themselves. And I think you know whenever you're negotiating negotiating with unions, if you're going to give pay increases, you have to couple that with commitments to productivity gains. And that, that it was it was just a blank check instead. I, I agree. Right. Let's turn to the Conservative Party, because this is quite interesting. There's been a great article by Dan Barker, who's a former Conservative Party member, and he was a parliamentary candidate as well. And he talks about the Conservative Party rushing towards getting a new leader, and we know all the runners and riders and all of that. Kemi Badnot, by the way, is the clear favourite at the moment amongst Conservative Party members to replace Rishi Sunak as leader. So uh, she is backed by 24%, eight points ahead of Tom Tugendhat, cleverly at 14%, Jenrick at 12%, pretty Patel, fifth at 11%, Mel Stride at 2%. Dan Barker's written an article which I think has enormous resonance saying that they're rushing to find another leader but they haven't actually addressed why they lost. What, what is it to be a Conservative? Why did they lose so badly? So the timing was terrible. So actually, had Rishi Sunak held on, he would have got better economic news and he could say that actually things are improving. Um, do they know what it is to be a Conservative? I don't think they do. I, I, so I, I disagree that they're rushing. You know, it's, it's a hundred day campaign. So I, I think they're, they're taking quite a lot of time. I think that the trouble is, is that after 14 years in government, it might take more than one leader for them to find the answer to that. I think they need to, they need to think about where their vote was being squeezed from. So obviously it was being squeezed by reform, but it was also being squeezed by the Lib Dems and from the Greens. So they have to, they've got a lot of sort of different things to consider mm. about, you know, if you, if you, if voters really care about immigration, they're quite, they're probably quite likely to go for reform. If they sort of see themselves as kind of more I don't know, sort of sensible middle class, Mark Berg, go to Lib Dems. If they care about environmental issues, maybe go to Green. So they have to think about, you know, what, what's their USP? I, I mean, for me, I, I, would, I would think something along economic lines would be sensible, but, you know, it doesn't seem like that's really the case that many of them are making right now. No. Where, where do you stand in terms of the Conservative Party, and particularly with young people? There was something I was reading earlier. The average age, I think, of someone who votes Conservative is let's just say older, um, considerably older, they're not appealing to young people. The median age, here it is, 63 is the average age of someone who votes Conservative. So that is not a great place to be if you're a dynamic, evolving party. And we know that the political parties, Labour and Conservatives, are losing voters. Reform says, and I would say that, wouldn't I, that um, it is gaining uh, more members. And the Conservatives are now saying, this is according to Mel Stride, that, the, you, that actually the way that Conservatives need to operate is to give young people tax breaks to help them buy a home and I think there's enormous merit in that actually to show young people actually if you save you can buy a home you can be aspirational and that was the that was the very essence of Margaret Thatcher and the idea that you could buy your home and I remember buying my first home when I was what 25 it was an enormously important moment yeah I, I agree actually um, I think that um, Mel Strive made a very good point about um, bringing ho home ownership back to younger people. I think the tax break he's, plan he's planning, I think that's a very good idea. I, d I slightly disagree with Ben uh, on a couple of things. I, I feel that actually the Conservative Party's loss is very complex and it can't be put down to one issue. And I, I don't agree with the assessment that you know, some people have put forward that they just lost ground to reform. I agree with what you're saying. They, they lost ground to other parties. but. For me, their loss doesn't sit with one issue. I think people were tired of the sleaze and the, the um, all the issues that were befalling their government. But actually, they need to be they need to become known again for what they were known for, which is competence in government and straightforward economic policies that work. But, is it, but isn't the issue that actually it's not one party, it's multiple parties. You've got the One Nation lot, the ERG, you've got the Conservative Growth Group, you've got all these people. It's such a disparate party, it's sort of all held together like this big blancmange and it fell apart. Yeah, I th I'd, I'd agree with that. And that's why the point I made that actually they need to be known for one thing, one sort of non-political thing, which mm. is competence and good governance. 
because the, the policy disagreements are always going to come and have always been there for the Conservative Party. Mm. They can't let reform and Nigel Farage distract them and p sort of pull them further apart. I think they need to unite behind one thing, which is competence and good governance. And that's the, policy, um, the point that James Cleverley's made a lot in his campaign. It's not about one policy issue and it's not about one party like reform causing us difficulty. Actually, we need to get back to what we've always been best at doing, perhaps, which is just governing well. OK, so who is your money on or who do you want to lead the party? I think for their period in opposition, I think James Cleverley would be a good person to attack Labour in the right way for them. I don't think he leans too far to the left or too far to the right. I think Badenoch, obviously, she's got an incredible mind, but she's quite good at starting fights with people that she doesn't <laughs> and fights that she doesn't need to have i think they need to be unified in opposition i think cleverly could be it, it, isn't james cleverly called james not so cleverly yeah but there <laughs> i mean i i couldn't possibly comment on how clever he is <laughs> no but, well, i couldn't yeah uh, but i think i think i look i think he's a very good speaker i think they yeah, need yeah. someone who can unite the party and attack labor because labor whether you agree with their policies or not right now what we can say is they're not being properly held to account by the opposition and they need someone to do that and, and, maybe, and maybe that's Ben's point, actually, is that they do need a leader to hold Labour to account, because at the moment, Labour's got a, so it's a free ball at the moment. They can pretty much do what they want. Who do you think would be the best leader? I, th I think Tom Tugendhat would, would probably have the broadest church outside of the Conservative Party. So I think that, that would be a... That, so, that, so with the aim of attracting more people in? Yes, because uh, yeah, I, th I think there's a real danger that you know, they, they go down into their own sort of echo chamber and, and comfort zone mm. and you know, don't come out for another 15 years. So I think they need to sort of look broad and, and you know, I mean, your, your, your point about kind of the competence issue, I, I'd say that it sort of potentially splits into two problems they have. One, one is the, sort of the competence and the cultural change, which I think they need to go through, but you, you do also need to stand for something. So I think that's the... And, and, what, and what about this idea about the tax breaks? This is uh, essentially uh, this idea that uh, you, you have money, this is what he's calling the Head Start scheme. A person in their first job would see the first £5,000 of national insurance paid not to the tax man, goes into a personal savings pot, that is then invested into an ISA or used for as, a, as a deposit for a first home. Is that, is that appealing enough for young people? It might be, but I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's, a, it's another issue of subsidising demand in, in housing, which will just push up asset prices even higher. What, what the Conservatives should be doing is thinking about you know, good economic theory, what's the problem here? We've restricted supply, we need mm. to build more homes. Mm. That obviously will be challenging for their older voter base, but I think that's where the solution is. And, and do you think it is possible for, young, for the Conservatives to win back young voters? Because certainly, and I know this from experience, reform's doing very well with young people, and there is a, you, you can argue why that is. Can the Conservatives bring them back in? I'm, on, I, I'm honestly not sure they can. I, th I think the, the brand damage over the last 14 years of, of, of you know, they're, they're, I, th I think sort of Brexit austerity and then sort of generally being seen to favour old people at the expense of uh, at the expense of the young. I'm I'm not sure sort of that that as a combination is is you can come back from that. Can the Conservatives win back young people? Uh, I don't think so. And I think reform have done well at holding the ground. Lots of young people culturally and socioculturally align with reform. I don't think Conservatives can get gain back that ground. I agree with Ben. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think they, they can change their sort of overall perception that the country has of them. They need to do that, and the next leader needs mm. to do that. I think young people, that's a very difficult thing to regain. Fascinating. Stay where you are. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. William and Ben there. Uh, we'll continue with our Future Politics panel after this break. This is Weekend Breakfast. Good morning. <laughs> Anyway, I'll stop for the minute because William Barclay, undergraduate student of philosophy and politics and Ben Cope, political writer and commentator, are here for our future politics panel. I saw this story this morning and I thought I'd ask you. Um, it's a conversation I've had in my family a great deal about what age should you give a phone to children. There's a big story in the Telegraph this morning. Parents should not give primary school children smartphones. Amazingly, this has come from EE, uh, a big uh, provider of mobile phones, a big major telecoms firm, and basically saying that if you're under 11, you should have a brick phone. So basically, you can call and you can text, and that's it. I think that's it's a, it's a good display of corporate leadership actually from EE e, e, who might be worried about being sort of hit by some kind of regulatory crackdown down the line if if, if sort of they don't fix it if it, you know given that the government don't seem to be stepping in here I, I think under eleven is is way too young to be having a, a smartphone certainly for having. When did you go on? 
I think I got one at about 13, but then I didn't get social media until later. Because um, I'd say there's a difference between being able to like use Google Maps and having TikTok. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I think social media later. And how, how much do you watch social media now? Not that much. I, well, I use Twitter, but right. I'd say that's sort of half for work. OK. What yeah. about you? What age should you give kids a smartphone? I think so. I got a smartphone when I was about 13. And I and it could do everything, could it? And it could do everything. It was an iPhone. Um, I don't think you should get one at all earlier than that. I think the hot... I think so what age? 13, 14, 15. I mean, you, the thing is, you don't need... You only want one because <laughs> everyone else has got one. Yeah, that's right. Very so true. you don't need it. So, so also the impact, this is why we're talking about it as a family, the impact, and I think, I don't know if this is true of boys, but certainly of girls, is the imagery, the social media imagery the whole time about, you know, these the images which aren't f true at all, and, and uh, the sort of ideas of losing your confidence because you see beautiful people on whatever Snapchat or Instagram or whatever it is. And I, I really do worry that also children are spending far too much time on their phones and not enough time actually working and being in the present and being in the moment. Yeah, I completely agree. I'd also say I actually think that's only the tip of the iceberg. I think the way Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, the way these algorithms and these companies work to sort of harness attention, monetize it, keep children and keep mm. any human being for as long as they can attached to their screen, I think it's totally warped the way we see politics, the whole world around us, how we view our time. I think it's had a huge, huge change on the way society works. And I think we're only just coming to understand how big that change is. And where do you been. get your news from? Uh, a, a lot, like quite a bit of a, tw too much of it from Twitter. And I think Twitter's <coughs> actually become a lot worse since Elon Musk took over. Um, I read the Times, I read papers, but I mean, most You're of You're unusual. Yeah, I'm unusual. My sisters, most of the young people I know, TikTok is quite a big yeah. source of news for them. And what about you, Ben? Um, so I, I read the papers and, and Twitter. Are you unusual? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I work in communication, so you don't have to read the papers. Right. And, um, and so, but, but, but I agree. I mean, I, I agree that I think far too many kids are spending far too much time on social media and not enough time actually living and enjoying life as it is. I entirely agree. I think we have to think, like, so w what benefit is a 13-year-old getting from being on TikTok versus, you know, mm. anything else they could be doing? And I think... You know, I, I think probably there's a big role for schools here because I think it's hard for individual parents to, to sort of lay the law down when, you know, children will be saying... Oh, well, so and, and, and that's William's point, isn't yeah. it? That if one kid has it, then you feel left out if you don't have it. Yeah, so I, th I think the gov government needs to give advice for schools about mm. how to sort of set standards and, and help parents out here. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much indeed to both of you, to William Barclay there and Ben Cope. And that